That's why somebody was asking me about it. How we health behavior and the, the health behavior? Behavior health, sure. The behavior health subcommittee of the House Committee on Health Care to Order and open up an informational an informational hearing and bring up the our folks from the Oregon Health Authority to talk to us about what's going on over on the um, the executive branch in this area. Yeah. Mr. Allen, you join us? Yes. Good morning. Mm. Uh, that, that's what I'm looking for. Is the We've got two or three topics for you. Is that right, Steve? Thing that would happen that's correct. Uh, we are. Chair Greenlick, uh, Steve Allen, for the record, uh, OHA Behavioral Health Director, and with me. Good morning, Dolly Matucci, Superintendent at Oregon State Hospital. Welcome, Superintendent. Thank you. And our first presentation uh, has to do with the state hospital and primarily with the aid and assist population. So we want to begin uh, with a discussion about what's been changing in the landscape in Oregon, but with a recognition that uh, the competency restoration population across the nation has been growing exponentially for the last uh, five to ten years. So this situation that we find ourselves here in Oregon that we're, we're going to be talking about in some detail is not unique to Oregon. There is a trend nationally that, frankly, uh, we do not nationally understand all that well uh, that is going on, of which uh, Oregon has a role to play. We'll also talk of, can you however, just, can I'm you sorry. just give a, a sentence about what we're talking about? Yes. Yep. Thank you, uh, Chair Greenlick. Um, so, the primary piece that we're talking about today has to do with competency restoration, which is the case in which someone is arrested for a crime. And when they're brought to the authorities, often in jail, they receive an assessment. And if that assessment shows that that person isn't able to competently aid and assist in their own defense, then resources must be uh, made available to restore that competency so that they can participate meaningfully in that process as a, as a matter of civil rights. Thank you, Steve. So, um, when again looked at nationally, there's this trend is going upwards, and the primary place where people have received competency restoration here in Oregon and across the nation has, has been in state hospitals, and there's a reason for that. But what we'll also spend some time on today is that uh, creates its own set of problems, and it's not the best way to address this challenge. So we'll be talking about the, ho the state hospital as an initial focus, uh, uh, but then we want to move on to community restoration because we think that's where uh, the real uh, ability for Oregon to, to move uh, past this crisis that we're currently in exists. I'll also want to talk a little bit about pieces that are unique uh, or more unique to Oregon but uh, land equally on our uh, uh, our sister states to the south in California and, and north in, in Washington. What we share across all these three states are really high rates of homelessness and you'll we'll talk a little bit about that relationship between competency restoration aid and assist and homelessness but also but also high rates of drug abuse and especially concerning is methamphetamine abuse. We, uh, this creates uh, or exacerbates the challenges with competency restoration here in Oregon in ways that uh, the rest of the nation doesn't ex experience, at least not in the same way that we do here in the western states. So in this first slide, uh, Looking at uh, this growth that I've been talking about, uh, the forensic admissions to the state hospital have increased significantly over the past five years, the aid and assist population doubling during that period of time. Community-based uh, services have not kept pace with it, that uh, increase in demand, and we've been struggling at the state hospital to keep up with that pace. Uh, we went through a period of non-compliance with our federal mink order that we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. Uh, with 370s, we've been in compliance since July of this year, but that's uh, one of the struggles that we have. 
and those uh, capacity challenges uh, impact other parts of the system, especially in, including the uh, civil commitment population. And as we'll talk about, there's a third population the hospital serves, guilty except for insanity, that also has a role to play, a, a very significant role to play in the dynamics that we're currently seeing. And with that, I'll turn that over, turn that over to Superintendent. Chair Greenlick and members of the committee, again, my name is Dolly Matucci. I'm the superintendent at Oregon State Hospital, and it's my pleasure to give you an update as to the status of the state hospital this morning. So, as you all know, Oregon State Hospital provides a vital role in the behavioral health continuum. We are dedicated to the diagnosis and treatment of people with mental illness needing a hospital level of care specifically including 24-hour on-site psychiatric and nursing care provided in a secure environment. We are here to provide treatment, stabilization, safety, and support for individuals to transition back into their communities. We do, we do so across two campuses, the Salem campus and the Junction City campus, with 30 active units and 668 beds. As we speak this morning around the uh, pressures within Oregon State Hospital and the community, I want to recognize that Oregon State Hospital serves individuals across the 36 counties and that we do so under um, aid and assist orders for individuals that are civilly committed as well as individuals at the hospital on GEI commitments. As of January 1st, 2020, 40 Four percent of our patient population was those individuals under aid and assist orders. Twenty percent were there on civil commitments, and 36 were receiving services as guilty except for insanity patients. I'd like to compare that to 2018, where our aid and assist patient population comprised 38.5 percent of our population. Individuals under civil commitments were 26% of our patient population, and those under GEI were also 38.5% of our population. If you go a few years back from 2018, our patient populations at the time of the mid-2000s were approximately one-third for each commitment category. So our populations have shifted over time. Individuals that are under aid and assist orders, as Steve introduced earlier, the focus of this inpatient treatment is designed to stabilize psychiatric symptoms and to help individuals understand their criminal charges so that they can aid and assist in their own defense. It is a narrow skill set. It does not require that an illness be eliminated only any symptoms of that illness be stabilized so that they no longer interfere with the individual's ability to participate in their court proceedings. And as Steve indicated, the hope is that the majority of those services could be provided to an individual in their community as we build that continuum. Oregon State Hospital also serves individuals under civil commitments uh, as well as voluntary by guardian. These individuals are sent to the hospital because they are eminently dangerous to themselves or others. They are unable to provide for their own basic needs due to the severity and persistent nature of their mental illness. And again, those individuals that come to the hospital under a GEI, guilty except for insanity, commitment are individuals who committed a crime while experiencing symptoms related to their mental illness that inhibited their ability to understand the connection between their behavior and their crime. People admitted under a GEI order are under the jurisdiction of a separate state agency, the Psychiatric Security Review Board. One of the drivers of the shift in patient population over time, as well as our current capacity challenges, is the dramatic increase in the aid and assist population in Oregon. And as Steve indicated, it is a trend that is occurring nationally. The uh, aid and assist average daily population has increased substantially in the last eight years. 
substantially being 149%. The number of admissions from an average 30 a month in 2012 is now an average of 60 admissions a month in the last two years. The average number of discharges for the last two years has been 56 a month, and in November and December of 2019, the average discharge number was 48 a month. Over time, Oregon State Hospital has made changes to keep up with this increase in demand. We have uh, streamlined our assessment and treatment methodologies for this patient population, ensuring effectiveness and efficacy, as well as trying to make sure that we do that in the shortest time possible. Our current um, average length of stay for individuals under an aid and assist commitment is 89 days. We increased the number of forensic evaluators that perform competency restoration evaluations. Those evaluators provide service to individuals within Oregon State Hospital as well as those in the community. And our individuals under aid and assist orders are now in more units across the hospital than they were in years previous. In the fall of 2018, however, we experienced an unexpected and unprecedented increase in aid and assist orders. And in order to meet this demand, we converted a unit that was dedicated to serving individuals under civil commitments to one serving individuals under aid and assist orders. At this point in time, we had four units that provided services to individuals under civil commitments and the number of open beds within each of those units enabled us to consolidate four units to three so that we could then have that unit available for individuals under aid and assist orders. Due to increasing demand, however, we converted another unit serving individuals under civil commitments to that of aid and assist in July of 2019. When we made this conversion in July of 2019, we put our first pause on civil admissions. What that meant is individuals waiting to come into the hospital for civil services needed to wait as we transitioned our units and our staff training for that change in patient population. With this second conversion in July of 2019, we opened a total of 26 beds on the Junction City campus to provide service to individuals under civil commitments. Within those 26 beds, 10 were in a hospital level of care within the um, hospital itself within a secured perimeter. And the other 16 are at a residential treatment home level of care divided between two cottages, eight beds each on the Junction City campus. So we lost 26 on the Salem campus, moved them to the Junction City campus, and there is a different composition and level of care of those beds. As we saw the aid and assist population increasing over the years, both OHA and OSH took proactive steps to address the change in capacity. And I believe 2017 Health Services Division put together a POP for community-based services and supports. And at the same time, while OSH was adding hospital capacity, making internal improvements to serve three patient populations, we also partnered with stakeholders to address the larger community and state issue of increasing demand for aid and assist beds and spearheaded stakeholder groups for legislative solutions, which as you know, included SB 24 and SB 25. So if we look at the graph presented, it identifies average daily population pre and post SB 24. The shaded area is pre SB 24. So if we look at the post, we can see that the spike in August of 19 for an average daily population of 27.2, 
uh, 275.8 is pretty easy to explain. We converted a unit, we stopped our pause, and we increased 25 individuals in a pretty short order of five days. So that spike in patient population is identifiable and explainable. And then you see a low, de uh, slight decrease in the um, average daily population. What we're seeing there is the positive effects of SB24 that um, facilitated the 9B process. The 9B process enables treatment teams at Oregon State Hospital to identify when individuals no longer need a hospital level of care and can receive competency restoration in the community. So you can see a drop in the patient population as those individuals were being stabilized, released to the community for ongoing competency restoration. And now we're seeing a spike that started in November of 19. It continues today, which is a combination of the ongoing demand and decreased discharges through the 9B process. And when we think about the de decreased discharges with the 9B process, it goes to what Steve will speak to later, which is really the limited capacity in the community to provide all the services and supports that are necessary. So some of the increases and decreases are readily explainable to what we've done in the hospital and what is happening at the community. And at the same time, it's a complex problem with lots of puzzle pieces, pardon that expression. And we need time to really identify the root causes of all of those pieces so that we can best build the continuum. So we will, as OHA, be looking for resources to be able to do that in-depth work. The 2003 Mink decision requires Oregon State Hospital to admit people under Oregon Revised Statute 161.370 orders within seven days from the day the judge signs the order. OSH has maintained compliance with the Mink requirement between 2003 and October of 2018. In the fall of 2018, we had an unexpected and unprecedented spike in aid and assist orders, which resulted in a period of inconsistent compliance beginning October of 2018. We um, restored compliance with that order on July 25th, 2019, and have been compliant ever since. And given all that we've done to manage capacity within the hospital, Given all of the efforts that the community and OHA have made to build capacity across the continuum, including competency restoration, we continue at near record high numbers with 282 individuals in the hospital this morning under aid and assist orders, which is not sustainable and it puts compliance at risk. We're looking at compliance on a week by week basis. One of, the uh, one of the contributing factors, actually, to our current capacity challenges and threatening compliance is that of an increase in the average daily population of individuals under GEI orders that we've experienced this last year. In the last year, that patient population has increased by about 27 patients. And although an increase of 27 patients is much less dramatic than what we've been seeing regarding aid and assist orders, a small increase in this patient population has a much greater impact on our bed utilization, our flexibility to move people within the hospital, and longer lengths of stay. So let's take a look at what is driving that. If you look at the graphic, the average length of stay for a single episode of care for an individual under a GEI commitment is 1,306 days. If you look at individuals under other commitments, you can see that that one bed serving an individual under a GEI commitment could serve seven patients under civil commitments based on their average length of stay and 11 individuals under an aid and assist order based on their average length of stay. So an increase of 27 individuals has had a tremendous impact on our bed utilization opportunity and the throughput of individuals across the hospital. What's 
very pressing to date in the community is the conversion of civil units that we've made across Oregon State Hospital in order to maintain compliance with the mink order and the need for services to individuals under aid and assist orders. The unit conversions we've made in 2018 and 2019 reduced hospital capacity at the hospital level of care bed by 42 beds. That has had a huge impact on the community hospitals for individuals that are in their care waiting admission to the hospital. We reduced by 42 hospital care level of beds while we increased with the 16 in the RTH level of care. The wait to get in is further exacerbated by the fact that we have individuals at the hospital that no longer need hospital level of care under civil commitments that are ready to transfer into the community. And if there's a delay in their placement based on not having the right bed available or services, et cetera, the system backs up and that's what we're experiencing is the decrease in 42 beds and individuals under civil commitments waiting for a community placement. As of Friday of last week, we had 59 individuals waiting admission to Oregon State Hospital under a civil commitment. Of those 59 individuals, 31 of them are in the metropolitan area. So we can see a consolidation of um, huge impact in Oregon happening in the metropolitan area. Previously, we were very consistent with an average admission of 25 individuals a month under civil commitments and pretty well well paced with discharges at that same rate of 25 a month. When we um, had to institute a pause of civil commitments in December of 2019, this was just last month, right before the holiday season, we've seen that tremendous impact on the community. In December, rather than 25 admissions, we had nine individuals admitted under civil commitments, and thus far in January, four. So a major change for those individuals and the community. Additional capacity is required at Oregon State Hospital to main com maintain compliance with the mink order and to serve individuals needing competency restoration at the hospital level of care. OSH currently has two vacant units at the Junction City campus. Those units are 25 beds each and they are they are licensed at the secure residential treatment facility level. One option we have if those two units were to be activated would be to take the individuals currently on the Salem campus on our SRTF level of care, which are primarily those individuals under GEI commitments, transferring some of them to the Junction City campus and then on the Salem campus, taking those vacant SRTF level of care beds and internally transitioning individuals under aid and assist orders that no longer need hospital level of care, SRTF. but for which the community capacity is not yet there. Oh, SRTF. SRT. Oh. Um, Chair Green, like SRTF stands for Secure Residential Treatment Facility. Thank you very much. So it would be a transfer across campuses so that on the Salem campus, we had internal flow of individuals that no longer needed hospital level of care for competency restoration, but had not yet been mm -hmm. restored to competency and were, were waiting placement in the community. While this would allow us to maximize our bed capacity across two campuses, this still serves primarily those individuals under aid and assist orders. It does not provide an immediate relief to those individuals requiring state hospitalization to treat their severe and persistent mental illness. What it does is give us internal capacity and some flexibility as we continue to come together as, to, as a community to look at the levers that are connected across individuals experiencing mental illness in Oregon and how 
three, three commitment categories, frankly, aid and assist orders, civil commitments, and GEI commitments intersect in terms of the needs for services and supports and where those services and supports can best be provided. So if you have questions, I can entertain those now. I have a question. Go ahead. Thank you. So as I'm, tr um, thank you, thank you for your presentation, um, Chair Greenlink. As I um, am trying to understand how all of these fit together, um, and how you are trying to open up capacity, and I see the you know the great need for it. Um, what is the impact on the individual patient who is getting shifted? What is the impact on them in terms of their care and that kind of that continuum of care in, in both providers and care settings? Like what happens to that individual? I know like I don't even like traveling and going to a hotel. I can't imagine being shifted from a care facility to care facility. Okay. It, it has a huge impact. It has a huge impact on their emotional stability. <clears throat> Um, on their um, sense of being grounded and confidence in the environment in which they are in. And it has um, some repercussions as well in terms of their length of stay. Um, as we all have our own private providers, think about changing a change in your medical provider. It's, it is significant. And for individuals at the state hospital, it's not a single provider. Their care is provided by a treatment team. So it's a number of individuals on that treatment team. The staff that provide them daily assistance in the unit milieu and all of the other um, staff that they come in contact with, not to mention their immediate community. They are on a unit for a given period of time. It is not home. It is an episode of care. And at the same time, there is familiarity of peers. You develop relationships, and that becomes your community for the period of time in which you are there. So to move those communities, whether it is across the a single campus or two has impact. And it also has impact on their family and friends support structure. Not all of our individuals have a support group that has the flexibility and ability to move with them as it relates to being available to attend treatment care conferences, to be available to visit and be physically present. So that has a consequence as well, as does placement in terms of being discharged maybe from Junction City closer to Eugene when your ultimate destination is Marion County. So there is a human toll that is paid with those transitions. Thank you, uh, Representative. Uh, Thank, you. Thank you, Chair Greenlick. Um, I have a question about some of the things that were discussed a little bit earlier in the presentation and kind of highlighted all throughout, which is that this population um, across all of these categories is continuing to grow. In terms of trying, I, I know you said that we don't yet know what is really behind all of that, but I wonder about the type of data that we're collecting about these populations to see if there are any simul similarities, economic background, um, you know, something that we could try to pin to, like, what is spurring this, this increase. Chair Greenlake, Representative Mitchell, I think this is the perfect time to turn that over to Steve Allen as he will be speaking to some of those elements. Perfect. Well, let's, let's get another question in this Certainly. regard before we move. Representative Hayden. Thank you, Chair Greenlake. Thank you for the presentation. Um, <clears throat> wanting to get a little more um, uh, a broader picture of, you said, I believe, uh, in December you admitted nine, mm -hmm. I think that was under the aid and assist, in January four, you, you had between 55 and uh, 59 people on a wait list, um, and you've <clears throat> uh, proposed two 25-bed um, Junction City expansions under the secure residential facility, if I'm saying that right, I left that screen, treatment facility. Um, even if you had that full 50 bed capacity, it wouldn't <clears throat> clear your back backlog, it would go a long ways. But you've mentioned multiple times um, putting them in, you know, until you have a placement in the community. I wanna hear about placement in the community. Can you give an example um, or can you give us an idea of how many 
beds there are in the community for these patients transitioning out. And I mean community statewide and where they're at. So I'd really like to get a better feel for that. Where I'm getting at is, you know, we're gonna have to, in a short session, you know, I can imagine if these people cost between $1,000 and $1,400 per day, and we're gonna open 50 more beds, we're gonna be looking at a pretty significant financial rebalancing of your budget in the short session versus what can we do in the community to speed that up. So that's really what I'm trying to get a handle on. Where does this committee commit those resources? <laughs> Chair Greenluck, Vice Chair Hayden. Um, I can address the first part of your question in terms of the information I provided for December and, and November, no, for December of 2019 was related to the number of individuals we admitted under a civil commitment. Okay. So that was nine admissions in December of 2019 versus what is normally 25 admissions a month. The number of individuals on the list waiting for admission to Oregon State Hospital for uh, civil services is that number of 59. And in January thus far, we have admitted four individuals. So I was speaking to the list for individuals awaiting admission for civil commitments and then acknowledging that the request related to two units on the Junction City campus are at the SRTF level of care, not hospital level of care, and that that, that movement, that flexibility would again build capacity for the individuals under aid and assist orders. So it's still not touching the need of individuals across Oregon for civil commitments. And then I think it most appropriate if I could ask um, Steve Allen to address the question about what is available in the community for providing services to, I believe you requested for both individuals under aid and assist orders and civil. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, Steve, you have two questions stacked up now. <laughs> Representative Mitchell and Representative Hayden. You, you want to refresh it on either of them? Thank you, Chair. Green Lake. Um, just checking our time, I think we had 40 minutes set aside for this. Uh, my section of the community I can do fairly quickly. I just want to make sure I have a sense of time. Is that five, should I limit my remarks to five minutes? Yes. Okay. And then you have a couple other things to talk about as well. Yeah, thank you. So with the time that I have, I think I, I want to just emphasize a couple of points um, and then get to the questions. So first, I think you heard loud and clear that uh, capacity is not just beds. Capacity is beds plus flow. And just to give a concrete example, if we have a 10-bed facility and the people who are admitted to that facility stay for a whole year, the capacity of that facility is those 10 beds for a year. If people stay 30 days rather than a full year, the capacity of that same 10 bed facility goes up 12 times because you can continue to admit people to that, to that program. It also, and, and this is getting to the question about do we need more psychiatric bed capacity, and I think the, the short answer to that is right now, yes, because we are at such a critical mass in terms of being able to admit people. To your point, Representative Salinas, these are impacting people's lives as uh, they're awaiting placements in the state hospital. We anticipate, but don't have data on this yet, that psychiatric boarding is likely going up in this environment. Um, and we are r really interested and concerned about the impacts these are having on uh, local acute care hospitals as we make this transition. But the answer is not for Oregon simply building more psychiatric bed capacity because the answer to all this is in the flow. And when I speak to our counterparts who are running the, the non-state psychiatric hospital capacity here in Oregon and ask them the question, do we need more beds? They say what we need is the community capacity to provide those services there, and that's actually where people get the continuity of care where, because the, the, the bed capacity is only intended ever to be temporary. Where the long-term stability for people comes in is in the, is in the community. Um, in terms of beds, um, I'm gonna skip ahead to this slide. 
and just make the comment that up until recently, Oregon, like most other states, has been a hospital-based competency restoration approach. And it, frankly, works for some uh, on a temporary basis because, frankly, some people who, who need competency restoration need all the tools that are available in a full-service psychiatric hospital. But there's also a subcategory of people, and primarily those now being affected by Senate Bill 24, who never needed a hospital level of care to begin with, who are now being served in the community. That we believe in the first quarter of data, that's, that number has gone up by 20%, and the community is not currently equipped to handle all those folks. The, that capacity has also reached its limits, which in which now you see a growing population at the hospital who we can't discharge because they don't have placements. Um, there's also a, a group of individuals who are now ready to return to the community if that capacity was available. And uh, Representative Hayden, to your question, when we talk about beds in the community, what kind of beds do we need? And what this chart, and I'm sorry for the size of it, you probably can't see it very well, what this is intended to show is that actually what this population needs is a variety of tools in the toolbox. So it's not just hospital level of care, it's secure residential for a period of time because people in some cases still need a locked facility but don't no longer need hospital level. But ultimately, uh, supported housing, uh, peer-delivered services, wraparound services can all support folks in the community in a way that the hospital is never intended because these are not intended to be long-term placements. Um, and we don't have all the tools that we need currently um, to help provide those services at the community level, which is where they needed. And, and lastly, and I'm, forget, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the other question, so I'll have to come back to that. But lastly, we need to get upstream. We're not being successful because we're not actually providing the services for in these individuals proactively and when they need it so that they can avoid arrest. Um, we're also not fully attending to the, the needs of these patients because we're not attending sufficiently to their substance use disorders. There's really high rates of methamphetamine meta abuse in this population, which we know can cause psychiatric conditions. We're not fully attending to that, and we, we need to at the community-based level. And I'll just uh, pause there, and if someone could remind me of the second question that I haven't yet answered, I would appreciate it. I, I think you sort of touched on it. My question related to what common characteristics do these populations tend to share? And you have a slide that, you know, it's homelessness, co-occurring disorders, which I'm sure includes addiction, um, and then individuals with complex service needs. So um, I, I think that roughly covers All right. it. Let's move on then. Thank you. I'll save you a meeting between now and the veterans. <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, Chair Greenlake, your, your question was we do have a veterans pre presentation coming yeah, next. A couple other issues I think you want to touch on before we move into the veterans. Mm -hmm. Is that right or not? Uh, a couple more slides. So, if, if is that. Um, so, in terms of community restoration, what do we need for that? And uh, what we need to know to be sure that someone can competently aid and assist is this legal skills training, but it's actually more diagnostic than anything. When people, most individuals can absorb the information they need to participate in their own defense when they are psychiatrically stable, and so when we provide them legal skills training and they can absorb and integrate that information, uh, we know that they're to the point where they can meaningfully participate. But what we also need to do is provide ongoing mental health services, the substance abuse uh, or use disorder treatment, forensic reevaluation. We need to know when uh, they're able to participate. Uh, we need uh, coordination and consultation with the courts, housing and support. Seventy percent of the people who are coming to the state hospital, um, the arrest that brought them to the attention of authorities, uh, they were homeless at that time. We cannot solve this problem without addressing homelessness. We also know without uh, a safe and supportive place to live, we can't provide the, the type of services to keep people stable. 
And we also need data collection, to your point, uh, Representative Mitchell, we need to know more about these <coughs> populations. Some of that information we have at the state hospital, some we don't. Uh, the state hospital information we have on substance use disorder is in the 60 to 70 percent range of co-occurring. In file reviews that we look at more information, we're up over 90 percent of people have uh, co-occurring substance use disorder. Um, transition to community restoration. Uh, SB 24 showed that 20 percent increase in restoration services. Um, we need more uh, residential facilities to provide the care, especially at the secure uh, level in the metro area. That's a pronounced need. And uh, appropriate service arrays uh, are in development. Over the next six months, we need to continue to monitor. We need more capacity. Uh, we need to monitor the caseload trends, and uh, we will be proposing, uh, we plan to propose uh, additional legislative and funding changes for the short session. Okay. Well, Thank you. I suppose this information here. Thank you very much. Thank you. I open the information hearing on veterans mental health issues. Steve, uh, Never did you again. And Kelly? Again, for the record, uh, Steve Allen, OHA, Behavioral Health Director, uh, and joined by... Uh, Kelly Fitzpatrick, the Director of the Oregon Department of Veterans Affairs. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Chair Green, Lake Vice Chairs Mitchell and Hayden, and members of the committee. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Representative Mitchell in particular for the opportunity to talk with you today about veterans' behavioral health. And I appreciate the subcommittee's interest in the specific topic uh, and the active role that you all have played in the broader issue. I thought it would be helpful to start out by giving you a, a picture of the environment of uh, the Oregonian veteran and the demographics uh, that we deal with. Uh, currently, we have a little bit less than 300,000 veterans in Oregon. That number, sadly, is decreasing as our World War II and Korean War veterans are dying. Uh, in the last year, we lost about 4,000 uh, veterans from those two eras. And uh, in terms of a breakdown of the demographics, Oregon has about 9% of the veteran population that are women veterans. Uh, interestingly, this is the only demographic that is anticipated to increase over the next several years, especially as more women are attracted to the military because uh, the Department of Defense has opened up all specialties to uh, women, including combat specialties. About 1% are tribal veterans, and then our LGBTQ veterans make up 7 to 9%, that's an estimate. And then African Americans and Hispanic veterans are each about 2 to 3%. So what is the, the veteran culture? What makes veterans worthy of special consideration and, and special focus when it comes to behavioral health? Uh, first, our veterans come from a military culture that has inculcated the warrior mentality uh, in their training when they were in the military. This was valuable because it made them strong. Uh, the warrior mentality instills that belief that you can do anything, you're strong, your buddies are strong, your service members to the left and right of you are there for you. Uh, there's no such thing as weakness, and weakness is certainly something that is to be stayed away from. It's mental toughness. It's strength. So on the negative side, uh, what happens with this warrior mentality is that service members often are afraid to report uh, medical needs and behavioral health needs in particular, because that can come with all sorts of negative ramifications and consequences. Uh, that individual will be stigmatized by his or her service members, won't be trusted to be that buddy to the right or left who's going to be there and in battle. 
Uh, certainly don't want to be seen as weak by reporting behavioral health needs. And uh, there's the risk of losing a specialty, a military occupational specialty, or even worse, being discharged because of reporting behavioral health need. Uh, and then there is also for certain individuals who have security clearances in the military, which is very common, risk uh, losing that security clearance, which is important to maintain that specialty field that the service member has. Uh, some other characteristics that can be unique to the military are military sexual trauma. Uh, that runs the, the gamut from uh, people who experience sexual harassment all the way to sexual assault. <coughs> PTSD, while it's not unique to the military, it comes from a, a unique place, that military experience where someone has experienced a, a significant trauma, anything from having seen fellow service members being injured or killed. Uh, it also includes military uh, or moral injury, uh, excuse me. Moral injury means that perhaps that individual feels guilty for having killed the enemy, another human being. Uh, TBI, traumatic brain injury, is also very common. In fact, uh, for the Afghanistan and Iraqi veterans, uh, the Department of Defense is actually reporting that it's the highest rate of uh, casualty among service members at more than 20 percent across the board for that war era. That uh, can include uh, bumps, jolts to the head, any kind of concussion, uh, whether it's in combat, uh, nowadays, uh, improvised explosive devices have become very common. But also, uh, I was a military parachutist when I was in the Army. A bad parachute fall could result in a concussion. So it runs the range of those types of things that can result in traumatic brain injury. Is that, is that increase a result of better treatments in the battlefield? Uh, people sure. surviving traumatic brain injury where they, injury where they didn't before? Sure, like if I understand your question, you're asking whether uh, service members are surviving traumatic brain injury more so than in previous eras. Yes. Uh, I would have to get back to you on that. I do know that the reporting is much higher in the current wars than it was even in the Vietnam War. It's almost twice as much as what it was in Vietnam. So it could be a combination of uh, better reporting, better identification. Certainly, there are a lot of uh, studies that are going on because of traumatic brain injury, both in the military, but also in the civilian sector. So that could very well be at, at the bottom of it. <coughs> uh, so it's against uh, the backdrop of the slide, which shows the uh, incredible and new partnership between uh, state, uh, OHA and ODVA, but also the federal VA. And together we reached out to uh, healthcare providers across the state and nearly 4,000 military members uh, for the Oregon Veterans Behavioral Health Services Improvement Study and that resulted in 19 recommendations. And so at this point, I'd like to turn things over to Director Allen. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I just want to say on behalf of OHA that we could not uh, be more excited and honored uh, to be part of this partnership uh, that is designed to prove, improve health care, especially behavioral health outcomes uh, for our veterans across the state. Uh, it's, it's very exciting and, uh, to be a, a part of this with them. As part of that partnership, uh, we've taken on a couple of things. One is I will talk in some detail about the Reed Group study uh, that relates to behavioral health care for veterans across the state um, in, a, in a couple of different ways. We also added a staff, Emily Watson, who's here with us in the room, is, a, is herself a veteran and has helped uh, coordinate all of this work. Um, as a way to um, help uh, link us all up uh, together as we move forward in this in this important area. So this, uh, I'll talk about this study uh, in a couple of different ways. One is there was an, an initial study that was uh, led by the Reed Group to better understand through conversations with veterans, healthcare providers, the agencies, where the gaps were in behavioral health care for our veterans across the state. As you'll see, we went back, uh, once this initial report was completed in a draft form, we went back to the communities to re-engage them to say, 
did we get it right? Um, are uh, the findings of this report, do they match uh, what that, the real needs are in the community? And then to begin to help us prioritize uh, what recommendations would come forward. And lastly, I want to talk a bit uh, about some of the, the current initiatives that are going on and, and the funding for those. So in terms of the initial study with the Reed Group, um, I'm, I'm going to capture these in two ways. One is I think everyone here in, in this committee knows there's some pretty significant challenges across Oregon that are unrelated to our veterans' populations. Um, we'll speak to, to those. The second, though, is there are uh, particular requirements, needs, uh, specialties that are related to our veterans that we need to attend to as well. So you'll see these two categories of things that we need to change regardless uh, of our veterans population and those things we need to uh, better attend to the specific and particular needs of our veterans. So um, the workforce and behavioral health workforce in general is inadequate across the state and in almost all categories in almost all places, but especially exacerbated in our rural and frontier areas and in areas uh, like psychiatry, addiction medicine, and substance use disorder are especially of needs. Um, but in addition, in over and above that, uh, the access to people who are trained to meet the particular needs of veterans, and as we're talking about with Director Kelly, uh, PTSD, traumatic brain injury, military sexual trauma, those types of things, working effectively, engaging effectively with a warrior culture. Um, as you'll see, stigma is huge um, in this, so stigma is a, a difficult area to overcome uh, throughout behavioral health care across the nation and, and as well as in Oregon, but it's especially pronounced uh, with our veterans, and you, you'll see evidence of that unfortunate high rates of suicide. Uh, the, necess the necessity, like in, in most areas in healthcare and behavioral healthcare, especially, we need to have more information to help guide our, our initiatives, and we have to have uh, special considerations around suicide and mil military sexual trauma, and you'll see housing as a recurrent theme. In terms of research, um, one of the really disturbing findings is that uh, much higher than uh, you would see in our general population suicide rates across all of our veterans. The, the largest number of overall suicides uh, by our veterans is in the older age group categories, but the highest uh, risk group is in our 18 to 35 year old category. Um, so we need to space, pay special attention to that. One of the other unique in related findings of that study is uh, veterans are less likely to report having depression, but more likely to commit suicide, which we think goes to the issue of stigma. They're in the warrior mentality. They're much less likely to engage and, and admit or to themselves or others that they, they are depressed and are at risk. And that uh, lack of uh, ability to engage with them then increases likely their, uh, their risk. Um, more uh, information needs to be gathered about uh, veterans' special risk related to opioid use disorder. Veterans are uh, more likely than uh, other citizens of the state uh, to die from overdose death. In housing, uh, you will see that uh, throughout um, behavioral health care, especially with uh, people with more complex and severe disorders, but that is a recurrent theme among our veterans, and it just makes sense. Uh, housing insecurity, homelessness uh, undermines veterans' uh, ability um, to reach stability and uh, to move on with their life. So uh, in terms of recommendations, um, a role for veterans in designing uh, system improvements. So this is a theme that we see throughout, uh, nothing about us without us. Uh, so recommending uh, veterans help shape the systems uh, that are needed to meet their behavioral health care needs and to leverage the state and local partnerships. And as we looked about uh, at where veterans are accessing services, it really is a complicated landscape. Uh, certainly, the, the VA is an important uh, source for health care benefits throughout the veterans community, but uh, as is OHP, uh, 
in OHA is related, but uh, lots of veterans receive health care in other places like commercial plans. And so to have a coordinated, comprehensive, cohesive fabric of services for our veterans populations, we really need all of these health care entities and funding streams uh, to be woven together in, into that coherent whole. This next slide looks at the second phase of this. So the first phase, as I mentioned earlier, was the Reed Group uh, reaching out to healthcare providers, the VA, to veterans, uh, to take a look at, at what was needed. Uh, we went back to the veterans and uh, our stakeholders in a variety of forums. Um, you can see those uh, marked throughout the state. Uh, a total of 247 individuals participated in these. Uh, we want to give a special shout out uh, to Representative Mitchell, Senator Golden, Representative Wallen, Representative Finley, Representative Helt, who all also participated in these. We had uh, a couple of focused forums, uh, two related to LGBTQI uh, uh, meetings and one uh, women specific. And uh, the structure of these meetings, they were extensive, about three hours each. Uh, they, meetings provided an overview of the report, uh, reflections on the report, small group activities designed to gather specific information and focused on uh, community prioritization of the report. In other words, what was most important to your community uh, in all of these recommendations, group discussions, uh, and development of local solutions. <coughs> So we had these two overarching uh, categories of information coming back from these. Uh, again, the statewide challenges around workforce improvements needed both the number of uh, work uh, people providing services needed to increase and the quality of those services needed to improve, understanding what services were being delivered, where and when, especially the non-VA system, and how they were integrated or not uh, within the a continuum of care. Um, needing consumer choice, especially uh, for individuals uh, who had military-specific concerns or needed engagement, that they had uh, choice in providers. Stigma, again, being a huge barrier, and the need for affordable housing were continuing themes that came out uh, throughout all of these in the state. The veteran-specific needs included cultural competence. Um, can you understand me? Can you engage successfully with me? Um, a, a real desire for peer supports related to military-specific uh, uh, interventions. Suicide prevention awareness, of course, huge in this population as a need. Uh, the need for wraparound services, so not just uh, outpatient but other services, and a focus on underserved uh, veterans' communities. Um, other uh, findings, confirmation of report findings generally. So uh, what we heard is that the report got it right, uh, especially regarding the behavioral health workforce challenges and the need to have people who are trained uh, to provide services specifically uh, for military and veterans with cultural com competence. Support of the existing peer delivery services. I'll talk a bit more about the pilot that we've got going on right now and increasing the availability of those. Uh, desired for increased veterans case management and care navigation. Uh, this, uh, we think, goes to uh, part of uh, the fragmented system that people are, that are in, but also a, a fairly low percentage of people are currently reported as uh, being uh, under the OHP, uh, Oregon Health Plan. Uh, where that care coordination um, it has existed and is being strengthened in CCO 2.0. Uh, we wonder with only 9% uh, currently reporting being under OHP if there may be a subpopulation who uh, would be eligible and ought to be enrolled. Um, so more work to do there. And improving access to affordable housing uh, is seen as key for veterans' homelessness and uh, also for stability for uh, interventions and behavioral health needs. So the top recommendations, and, and these aren't necessarily in order, uh, we're still gathering and uh, uh, working through all the data that we got back from those, those meetings, but these were all the, the highest or the most frequent on the list. Housing is huge, uh, reducing stigma as we've talked about, suicide prevention of course, and the behavioral health workforce. And in terms of next steps, uh, we are working with ODVA to, to align recommendations with existing programs, initiatives, and resources. 
We want to refine existing strategies to move forward with potential policy or funding recommendations that may be necessary as, as we move forward with this. Um, this falls into the bucket of we have work to do on behavioral health workforce in general in the state and then those uh, specific veterans needs. Um, so uh, at the top, we just need a, a stronger workforce in general. The bottom category is those uh, specific to veterans included the limited availability of publicly funded non-VHA providers, uh, re remembering that a lot of the services the veterans receive uh, aren't necessarily through the VHA uh, provider system and uh, people who are qualified in, to screen and to treat uh, concerns that are specific to veterans, TBI being among them, PTSD, military sexual trauma, peer delivered services, again, care management, care navigation, pipeline, and a pipeline for veterans to become uh, behavioral health providers at, at all levels uh, through the workforce continuum. So here's that list I mentioned uh, about uh, initiatives already in motion. So mental health first aid is an evidence-based practice uh, that is uh, being utilized throughout the country. There's a tailored version of that for veterans and military-specific curriculum. It's intended to help educate people on mental illness, to help identify, screen, and, and then engage. Uh, so we had in that first uh, two years biennium, we had 22 new instructors trained, two training sessions. Uh, we have uh, two additional instructor trainings with five training sessions coming up, so uh, greatly expanding access to this important service. The peer support specialists, we have three pilot sites, uh, one in Yamhill County, Best Care Treatment Services in Jefferson County and Deschutes County. Uh, we have um, uh, peers who uh, have military backgrounds uh, in all three sites, and we're looking to expand that. There's currently uh, being delivered through the CMHP, the county program. Um, acknowledging that uh, there's a lot of veterans receiving services not through the CCOs. Uh, we'll want to look at uh, uh, Medicaid reimbursement for these services and expanding those uh, given the interest in those uh, uh, in the next iteration moving out. Uh, veterans and military suicide prevention training, there's an RFP in development for healthcare provider training. Uh, as well as we have a number of uh, activities uh, related to outreach and uh, engagement efforts uh, across our agencies. So uh, the federal, uh, state VA, state agency uh, coordination, uh, government to government coordination with the uh, nine federally recognized tribes and NARA funding uh, for uh, the first Lines for Life Veterans Plus Suicide Prevention Conference. Uh, coming up and uh, ongoing community and stakeholder engagement opportunities built in. Uh, if there's an interest, uh, Chair Greenlake, I can uh, identify the particular amounts and, and funding for those uh, uh, initiatives that I've just discussed. Otherwise, that's the end of my formal comments. Okay. Have another hand. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair Greenlake. These two presentations, I'd like to kind of tie them together uh, going back to the 55 people that are in waiting on a wait list or the 282, how many, and it kind of ties off of uh, Representative Mitchell's question, how many are veterans? Uh, Chair Greenlick, uh, Vice Chair Hayden, uh, I don't have that information currently and I'm not sure uh, how readily the access is to that information because those individuals are currently being held outside of uh, uh, OHA um, okay, in, uh, in the, the state, state hospital. In, in the state hospital now, what is a, just an average percentage of veterans that are there? Say on your civil commit. Yeah. Representative Hayden, I don't have that information, um, but uh, Dolly may have that available. We'll get that to you. Your follow up quickly. Go ahead. So for years, uh, some of us have tried to get a, a, uh, additional help and the Oregon Health Authority goes through a certificate of need process and says that <laughs> we don't have a need. If we don't even know how many veterans are in the state hospital or how many veterans are on a waiting list, how can we take the position that under certificate of need, we don't need additional bed space for these veterans? Actually, I think we do know how many are in there in the hospital, I didn't get it for you. I saw that analysis, I'm quite sure. 
Chair Greenlick, Representative Hayden, we, we do have the number of uh, individuals who have identified uh, as veterans at the hospital, and we can get you that number. Thank you. Representative Mitchell. Thank you, Chair, <clears throat> Chair Greenlick. Um, so I wanted to go back to this idea of warrior, warrior mentality that you touched on and how that can create some obstacles to getting care to people who need it um, because they're much less likely to disclose and it becomes even harder probably on, on the private side for people who aren't under OHP that, to reach out to them. So I wanted to go back to these outreach and engagement efforts in just asking um, in the partnership between ODVA and the VA and OHA, how are you guys reaching out right now to those people to let them know that it's, a, that it's okay to disclose and to come forward? I mean, how, how do you identify those people and let them, and get them over that warrior mentality of it's not okay to, that to talk? That is courageous to come forward. Yes, yeah. and, and that you should. <laughs> Um, Chair Greenlick, uh, Representative Mitchell, and uh, Chair Greenlick, to your point about the courage that it takes to mm -hmm. come forward, the Pentagon has an initiative with that very message. So they're trying to help veterans before they even become veterans <coughs> as they're transitioning out. So the Department of Defense is trying to do a much better job with that. Uh, in addition, uh, the VA is also, the federal VA is also doing a better job of recognizing that they have to break through that warrior mentality and the special stigma. Uh, so they've come out with all sorts of programs, uh, again, to help with that transition from active duty over to the veteran status. So that's at the federal level. Mm -hmm. And so within the state, uh, our partnership has a ways to go, and that's part of what we're going to be working on with the prioritization of some of the recommendations that Director Allen has talked about. Uh, we, want, we recognize that need to break through that to underscore the message of courage that it takes to come forward and to help with that transition going forward so that we can help them to access both their federal VA benefits and also anything within OHP that they might also be entitled to. Representative uh, Nomo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, as you're talking about the warrior mentality, I, there's another aspect that I haven't heard mentioned today. And um, coming from family who have served in home health, there's a large group of veterans out there who don't believe they rise to the level of need and they would take services away from other veterans who need that, which from my perspective is more of a, more a true warrior mentality in that they don't need it as bad as somebody else. Um, at one point, and it was a different director um, of ODVA, I suggested that maybe they connect up with all the different home health organizations that go out and deal with, with individuals who are incapacitated at home who won't get help because they don't think they need as much help as someone else. Um, and I would hope that that uh, we would do that because I would suggest that those are also individuals who don't show up at these um, gatherings to provide input as to what their needs are. Uh, there's a whole uh, group of people out there. Um, just my suggestion. Uh, thank you, Chair Greenlick, uh, Representative Noble. I appreciate that suggestion. That is absolutely true. Uh, my own father, who is a Korean War veteran and Purple Heart recipient, uh, fought very hard when I tried to get him help for his hearing aids. And it was exactly that. He said, "I my hearing is fine. <laughs> Uh, of course it wasn't, but, um, you know, he, and he did not want to take away from people that he thought would be in much more need, and that's that's exactly right. And then, of course, the, the veterans from all of the different uh, war eras uh, often say that very thing. So thank you for that, that point. And uh, that is another aspect of the warrior mentality that we do have to break through. I appreciate your suggestion, uh, and I think at this point I'll, I'll put a little plug in for our new volunteer program that uh, we where we are uh, having volunteers who are trained to do outreach particularly in uh, assisted living and long-term care facilities uh, we did a pilot of a few different counties recently and now we're on the cusp of expanding that across the state so that we'll train volunteers to do more outreach to individuals who are at the older end of the spectrum who may be resistant to accepting help and try to break through some of that experience. So thank you. It's interesting, uh, having been around longer than many people, 
I, I think back to what I heard from the veterans of World War I, which were my, my grandparents, and they talked about shell shock as a, a war injury. I said, World War II, it became battle fatigue. In Vietnam, it became PTSD, but <laughs> the, we hadn't solved the problem with the veterans of any of those wars. Uh, along the way, we're, we still have a long ways to go in doing good work with Fitzpatrick. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Close the work session. Uh, Reverend Chair Greenland? Mitchell, thank you for bringing it to us. Yeah. No Chair Greenland? Yeah. yeah I'm sorry. I, I stopped one slide early and didn't give uh, Director Kelly an opportunity to get through her last bullet points. Uh, my apologies. Do we have an extra minute for her we to do that? We certainly do. Right, thank you. Thank you, Chair Greenlick. Uh, a lot of these next steps underscore some of the things that Director Allen mentioned previously, but we are absolutely committed uh, in, our, in our partnership to prioritize the recommendations in the report and clarifying lanes in the road and our agency roles and responsibilities, including working with the federal VA on an ongoing basis and uh, leveraging those state, federal, and local partnerships so that we can do better with our veterans who are in need of behavioral health care and access to that care. Uh, we'll determine whether we need to improve or expand the existing programs or develop new programs, especially as we're going into the development of our budgets for the FY21-23 biennium. And then, of course, we're looking forward to keeping our legislative partners updated on an ongoing basis. So uh, thank you again for your interest in this topic, and thank you for your help with our Oregon veterans and their families. Mr. Allen? Thank you. We're done? Uh, yes. Okay. I'll close the informational hearing on veterans and behavioral health and open up an informational hearing on the Alcohol and Drug Commission report and welcome. Good morning, Chair Greenlith. Uh, my name is Dr. Reginald Richardson. I get to serve as the Executive Director of the Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission. And we're here this morning to talk a little bit about our draft strategic plan and to answer any questions that you might have. Welcome back. Thank you. So I just wanted to go over a little bit about the Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission. We're an independent state agency created by the legislature in 2009 with the purpose to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of substance misuse prevention, treatment, and recovery services for all Oregonians. We are a policy board comprised of 19 members, 16 voting. Uh, members are appointed by the governor and confirmed by the Senate. We're charged with developing, among other things, a comprehensive statewide strategic plan that identifies priorities for prevention, treatment, and recovery supports. Uh, we started our strategic planning efforts last January, and we hired a consultant to help us to draft that plan. We are um, currently, uh, we have a draft. We have had 12 versions of that draft. We have sent it to uh, a number of uh, partners for feedback. We have um, got a overwhelming response uh, from our uh, partners, uh, and we just completed last week a review of all of those comments, and we have sent the current draft back to the consultant uh, so that those comments can be um, incorporated. We hope to have a much more working and clean uh, document by uh, the end of this, this month. Uh, we are planning also to um, uh, meet with our, stagens, uh, our uh, state agency heads later this month to ensure their uh, agreement to the plan. I'd like to also just talk a little bit about the problems that we face uh, relative to substance misuse here in Oregon. Um, 
we're the highest rate of substance misuse and substance use disorders in the nation. Nearly one in 10 Oregonians 12 and older have a substance use disorder. Alcohol use is being, alcohol use disorder being the most common type of uh, disorder impacting 7% of all Oregonians. And it's the third leading cause of death. Death from methamphetamines use increased nearly 400% uh, from 2009 to 2018. The proposed strategic plan, uh, again, is a plan that's not yet completed. We hope to have it done in February. It isn't due to the legislature and to the governor until July. Um, the plan reviews hundreds, we reviewed uh, hundreds of pages of documents. We conducted over 14 listening sessions around the state, um, which represented about uh, 200 organizations and individuals who participated in those listening sessions around the state, including our tribal partners. Our plan focuses on measurable outcomes um, to improve health, social, and economic indicators. It establishes processes for monitoring and reporting progress over time. It establishes processes for coordinating state agency efforts strengthening state leadership, capacity, and effective practices relative to substance use disorder. It includes strategies and activities, establishes a baseline for current spending, and develops a process for monitoring changes in spending and reinvesting cost savings over time. The plan also attempts to reduce silos by the implementation of a coordinated state system to respond to substance misuse. Uh, we recently held uh, meetings with our state agency partners uh, and developed a vision statement. We believe the way to attack this problem most efficiently by working with our state agencies by seeing this becoming a system. Uh, DHS, OHA, DLC, Oregon Youth Authority, et cetera, all have some part to play in this problem. We want, and we did, pull these entities together. There are 13 state agencies that make up our partnership. And we, we came up with a vision statement that you can view here. A comprehensive state-wide uh, system where substance misuse policies, investments, and efforts support healthy Oregonians and thriving communities. Our mission is to provide data-informed, integrated prevention, treatment, and recovery support services through public and private partnerships using equitable and culturally, linguistically, and gender-specific services. Um, again, I uh, just would like to name our partners, uh, Oregon Health Authority, Oregon Department of Human Services, Youth Development Council with ODE, the Higher Education Coordinating Commission, Oregon Youth Authority, Department of uh, Consumer and Business Services, Department of Corrections, the Liquor Control Commission, Oregon Lottery, Oregon Department of Housing and Community Services, the Oregon State Police, and Department of Education. Um, this chart is a study that we conducted, uh, actually was conducted uh, here in Oregon uh, a number of years ago. The study was called the Shoveling Up uh, Study 1 and 2. Um, we asked our consultant to help us to replicate that study, um, and we contacted the principal investigator who was involved in the previous two studies, worked with uh, DAS and the uh, budget office to help come up with these numbers. And I think the, the telling information about this chart is the amount of state dollars being used to pay for substance related problems more than quadrupled from 2005 to 2017, consuming by the most conservative estimates nearly 16% of the state's budget. About 15.8% of resources not spent on a core agency mission rather than substance misuse. In other words, that's the burden that an ineffective system <laughs> relative to substance misuse cost our state. There is money in our system. Um, it's how we're using that money to address this problem. Less than 1% of prevention, treatment, and regula regulations were spent. Uh, our strategic plan has, if done properly, 
it has some ultimate impacts that we are working to achieve. Our first impact is that we want to reduce substance use disorders and increase recovery. Our plan is conceived of uh, completing these tasks in five years. We want to reduce alcohol, tobacco, and other drug-related deaths. We want to reduce alcohol, tobacco, and other drug-related health disparities. And number four, we want to reduce economic burden of substance misuse on our Oregon state budget, budget so that we may re reinvest that money into prevention, treatment, and recovery supports. Within our plan, we have uh, goals that are designed to achieve this. You also have a handout that gets into much more specificity about each of the goals and some of our uh, activities that are involved in completing the plan. I just would remind you all of that is still uh, under review and is in the process of being revised. And as soon as we have a clean copy, I hope I'll get to come back again and actually talk to you uh, about the strategic plan having been completed. The first goal is to implement a statewide system that ensures substance misuse policies, practices, and investments and efforts are effective and result in healthy, healthy and thriving individuals and communities. Our second goal is to increase the impact of substance misuse prevention uh, strategies across the lifespan. Number three is to increase rapid access to effective SUD treatment across the lifespan. And four, increase access to recovery supports across the lifespan. And again, you have the handout with some of the additional information, which I'm not going to go over at this time. Um, what I would prefer to do is to engage in, a, in dialogue, questions and answers about anything that you are interested relative our, to our proposed plan. I, I have a question. Thank you, Chair Greenlack. So I, I, I really would like to know a little bit more. You, you want us to talk about all four of these impacts, right? Not just like one, two, and then go forward. Have a full dialogue <coughs> about all of them, right? Okay. Correct. So I am really, and, and I was surprised last legislative session too when they provided some statistics about how, how much alcohol really is like at the top of the list for substance use uh, problems. And so I want to know a little bit more about um, some of the plans that the commission has developed towards reducing um, alcohol-related deaths. So there's a couple of areas that I'd like to mention that um, we know and it's been well documented that the number one way in which to reduce the consumption of alcohol mm -hmm. is to increase the taxes. Um, that's been proposed. Uh, we're going to probably propose it again with our uh, Oregon Health Authority partner. Uh, we know that is an effective strategy. Um, we also know that there are uh, involvements in um, retail sales, uh, social uh, involvements as well that can reduce the consumption of, of alcohol. Um, I will direct you to a section of the plan um, in just one moment. Um, if you look on what is my page five, let's do it this way. And I'm not exactly sure what page it is on your handout, but it begins under uh, goal to increase the impact of substance misuse prevention strategies across the lifespan. One of the areas that we've uh, talked about is to decrease retail and social access to alcohol, tobacco, marijuana. Um, and then there are some strategies or goals that we have associated with that. Increase the knowledge, skills, and abilities of beverage servers, retail alcohol clerks, retail marijuana clerks to refuse sales of underage persons, to focus on increasing perception of enforcement and consequences for violating state laws, prohibiting the sale of tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana, developing and strengthening existing laws and policies, addressing underage alcohol, tobacco, marijuana use associated with the consequences of such use, we want to work to decrease family norms that make it permissible for the uh, overuse of alcohol. 
those are just some examples um, that we're looking to plan for. Mm -hmm. Is um, follow up? Right. Thank you, Chair Greenlick. Um, what about educational initiatives? You mentioned one of your partners is the Department of Education, and um, I, I, I'd like to hear a little bit more about educational initiatives to let people as well as young people know about um, why prevention or is probably the best the best uh, policy on that. Sure. So we've got. Um, uh, a objective to increase perception of harm for alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use, misuse across the lifespan by increasing uh, knowledge, which is an educational aspect. Mm -hmm. We're working with the Department of Education and the um, Higher Education Coordinating Commission to ensure that there are um, resources on every campus <coughs> in terms of higher education. Mm -hmm. We've made suggestions or we plan to make suggestions relative to recovery high schools and other sorts of plans that uh, look to um, get to what you just described. We want, we are working to increase knowledge of harms associated with uh, each of the drugs that we focused on. So the educational piece is an integral part of what we're mm -hmm. hoping to do. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I take it you don't intend to present even an outline of where your recommendations are going. I'm sorry, Chair, could you say that again? <clears throat> it is not your intention to present even an outline of the recommendations you're working on. Because the recommendations <laughs> thus far haven't been approved by the Commission, what you have in front of you is the draft recommendations that we have so far. But I just want to emphasize this is a draft since it hasn't been formally approved by the entire Commission. Okay, well, I'll close the hearing. And open an informational hearing on uh, a bit about Pardon me? where we're going. Okay. Thank you. If you don't have anything else to present, I'm closing the hearing. I just do need to let you know, somewhere along the line, your findings are going to get to this committee. And you may want to treat the committee with a little more respect. Would you call the next panel, please? Uh, Chair Green, uh, we have Mike Marshall, Heather Jeffers, and Jeff Blackford. Chair Greenlake, members of the committee, uh, for the record, my name is Mike Marshall. I have the honor and privilege of serving as the executive director of Oregon Recovers, an organization whose mission is to mobilize the recovery community to transform Oregon's fractured and complete addiction recovery system into a recovery-based continuum of care, recognizing addiction as a chronic disease. A mouthful, ambitious, and yet we're here today, I hope, to uh, stress that we are uh, poised to actually uh, be able to take huge steps towards accomplishing that mission. Um, I'm joined by actually Mike Schmidt with the Criminal Justice Commission, uh, uh, not Je Jeff Blackford from Chance. Um, Mike's uh, here to talk about the report that the legislature had uh, his commission do, and then Heather Jeffers with the Oregon Council for Behavioral Health. Um, and I will have both of them get into more detail about who or why they're here. Um, uh, I'm also a person in long-term recovery. Uh, later this month, I will celebrate 12 years of sobriety, um, which is uh, a huge gift, but it also is despite the system, not because of the system, that I continue every day to wake up and be in recovery. And uh, uh, that's a degree of privilege that uh, too many Oregonians don't have. And my goal today in, in um, talking with you is just to either remind you or really stress upon you that we are facing an emergency. We are in crisis relative to um, uh, addiction in Oregon. SAMHSA came out with their statistics last week and we inched up from um, having the fourth highest addiction rate in the country to the third highest addiction rate. It went up just by a small uh, 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 margin, but it's going in the uh, completely the wrong direction. Uh, we uh, uh, now rank 47th in access to treatment. Um, previously, we ranked 50th in that survey, but it's not because we did better, it's because three other states did worse. Um, uh, 
Representative Mitchell, to your point, five Oregonians die each day as a consequence of alcohol and alcohol-related deaths. We lose one to two people in drug overdoses, more than half of which are meth, not opioid-related, but methamphetamine-related, although many drug users are using both. Um, we have a combined total of losing um, seven people a day or over 2,100 people a year. 2,100 people a year. That's 700% higher than the worst year of the AIDS epidemic in Oregon. And yet we do not think of addiction, untreated addiction, at the same level. Seven people will die today, and then seven people will die tomorrow, and seven people after the day after that. Two people died of vaping this year, and there's all kinds of public dialogue about the need to ban vaping. I'm against vaping. I don't like vaping either. But the, it's to, to suggest that one is equal to the other it just uh, isn't appreciating the level of crisis that the state is in. And it's costing us a whole huge uh, lot of money. You just heard from Dr. Richardson, um, who presented even more recent data. This $5.9 billion annually is according to Echo Northwest. Um, and as a consequence of our untreated addiction rate, we have one of the, th the third highest youth incarceration rate. We have the second homelessness rate in the country. I actually think we're, we're not seventh in foster care. I think recent studies show we're third or fourth in foster care. And we have the third worst high school graduation rate that just doesn't seem to move from year to year despite every election season. It seems like that's all anybody wants to talk about. Um, the consequences, and as, as Dr. Richardson's shoveling up uh, study showed, is we're spending a huge amount of money on the consequences of this issue and virtually no money effectively on solving the solution. But I want to come back to our mission statement is about a fractured and incomplete system. There are good organizations with good people doing life-saving work on a daily basis, but the, the system itself is, is too fractured. What we need is a comprehensive continuum of care that's made up of four components. Sorry, uh, the, the primary cause of this is we don't have a system of care. It's fractured and incomplete. We don't have any clear point of accountability or authority for drug and alcohol policy in Oregon. The Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission, Dr. Richardson, has been reinvigorated over the last 18 months since the governor declared a public health crisis. But um, prior to that, there's, and it, we still, we have, uh, we have a new behavioral health committee, we have an opioid task force, we have the, the behavioral health director that you heard from earlier today. We have lots of folks that are focused on this issue, but there's no one person in charge. And if we are going to address an issue of the magnitude that we're dealing with here, seven people dying each day, $5.9 billion annually, then we need to have a degree of accountability and authority to fix that problem. Um, we've, we, up until, Recently, until now, we've never had a comprehensive strategic plan that looks at what do we need and how are we going to build it and how are we going to integrate all these different components. And honestly, let's face it, there simply has not been a political commitment in the past to deal with this issue. We have the lowest beer tax in the country. The price of uh, beer has not gone up or the, the tax on, on uh, beer has not gone up since 1977. And, um, it, you know, not surprisingly, we have the lowest beer tax and we have the least access to treatment. That is not a coincidence. Um, uh, but we are facing this unprecedented crisis. And as Dr. Richardson said, the way we're going to solve this crisis is by increasing the cost of alcohol, the number one, overwhelmingly number one contributor to this, reduce <coughs> consumption, reduce <coughs> underage drinking, and begin to create um, a line of revenue specifically for this uh, crisis. So, an emergency demand, we need a new continuum of care. We need a more comprehensive, integrated continuum of care. First of all, prevention. Uh, uh, the Criminal Justice Commission report that came out identified that of the money we spent on substance use disorder, I think it's up, upwards of 470 million per biennium, 3% of it goes into prevention programs. Uh, if the folks from the Oregon Health Authority were here would tell you that there's actually no recommended, from the Center for Disease Control, we don't have recommendations on what a prevention, statewide prevention program should be, because big alcohol has prevented the CDC over the years from ever developing those guidelines. So what we have to do <coughs> is extrapolate, <coughs> excuse me, from tobacco prevention programs. And we know that if, we, and, and that would make sense to some, uh, uh, at some level. 
if we were had a fully funded statewide alcohol drug prevention program, we would be funding it to the tune of $39 million a year for a state the size of Oregon. We currently are funding uh, prevention <coughs> programs within the Oregon Health Authority at $11 million a year. So a third of what the baseline recommendation is. Given we are one of the worst states in the country for addiction, I would argue prevention programs initially should go up dramatically higher. But even if we just wanted to get to what the recommended level is, we'd have to triple what we're currently spending. And what's really important to understand about that too is that the money we are sp spending, 85% of it is going to local prevention programs. And, and the best practices are that a local prevention program needs a statewide public education program to support it, to make it effective, um, that we need statewide messaging relative to that. The, the level of education that you are asking about simply does not exist within the current system. Uh, so let's just try and fund at the CDC recommended level. Secondly, intervention and engagement, which didn't show up on Dr. Richardson's um, slides, but we need to specifically focus on it. Uh, this legislature did a good job of starting to decriminalize addiction by defelonizing possession. However, that is an instrument um, that many people have utilized to get into recovery, not always willingly, but it is the one um, uh, opportunity we have to get people to consider treatment, to get people to consider staying in recovery. We take that away without beginning to build up the capacity of our primary care system and our schools and our parents and give them the tools they need and, and do that intervention farther upstream, we're actually being irresponsible by taking away the one hook we have to get people into prevention. We need to center a prevention, uh, an intervention and engagement program in primary care. We need our doctors and our nurses, not our sheriffs and our police officers, helping us with the, this, this medical, this, this uh, addiction crisis. Third, treatment on demand. I'm gonna let my colleague here talk a little bit about that, but the other thing that was really telling from the criminal justice report is how fractured the system is. And one statistic I'll share with you from that report is, is that Multnomah County, which puts in about $15 million of, of general money, otherwise not uh, 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 specific to addiction, into their system, they have one treatment bed per 1,100 people. No one knows whether that's the right ratio or not. We need to find that out. But Washington County, right next door, right across the street, has one treatment bed per 11,000 or 12,000 people. One per 12,000. Clackamas County has one bed per 39,000 people. So obviously, if someone's looking for treatment, if a doctor's referring someone or someone or a court is referring someone, they're going to go to the to whatever treatment bed is available. And in, in Multnomah County, can do a yeoman's work around this, and I think they actually are. But as long as the surrounding counties, as long as we don't have a statewide comprehensive program that's looking county by county or CCO region by CCO region or community by community, however the right metric is, the right measurement is, we're gonna continually um, see a system that remains really fractured. Um, the same is true of outpatient programs, the same is true of detox um, uh, 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 beds. Lastly, recovery support. This is the part of the system that the, the evaluation of the Criminal Justice Commission couldn't even find actually a, a record within the state of what investments we're making. But according to the U.S. Surgeon General, if we can keep someone in recovery for 60 months, five years, their relapse rate goes down to 15 percent. Five years, 15 percent. There's virtually, if Dr. Mendenhall from Central City Concern or uh, any of the other addiction doctors in Oregon were here, they would tell you there are very few medical conditions, if any, that if you invest in the recovery for five years, that you will see a, a relapse rate go down to 15% relative to a chronic condition. It's a great ROI. And yet we don't do any uh, uh, investment in that. Um, if there is a recovery community center in a community, it is mostly staffed by volunteers because it's, it's centered around a 12-step program and not by folks that are trained peers or trained certified alcohol and drug counselors or trained family therapists. Um, uh, uh, we know that housing is an issue, jobs are an issue. Somebody is uh, arrested because of their addiction, that record follows them um, and they can be in recovery two, three, four years. They still can't get an apartment so that they can get their kids back from Child Protective Services. They still can't get a job to pay for that apartment. Um, so we have to begin to uh, invest in the comprehensive aspects of all of this um, and recognize recovery support as one of the smartest public investments we can make and one in which we currently make virtually no investment.
So uh, I've been criticized today because I took a really complicated issue and, and basically boiled it down to three steps that I think the legislature could take with, uh, in the February session. And a year from now, we'd come back here and we'd all be really pleased by the number of the progress we've made relative to deaths, hospitalizations, and everything else. But they're, they are big lifts. Number one, raise the price of beer, wine, and cider by 20%. We'll reduce underage drinking significantly. We'll, we'll reduce binge drinking significantly. 50% of the alcohol sold in Oregon today will be utilized in binge drinking, which is the biggest cause of hospitalizations relative to, to alcohol. Um, and put that dedicated line of revenue into implementing the Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission plan. <laughs> We finally have a plan that looks comprehensively at how do we integrate the system, the, the, the parts of the system we have, and fill in the gaps and start to produce amazing outcomes that are going to create co amazing cost savings within the criminal justice system, within the social service system, within the health care system. And then lastly, appoint a recovery czar. Let's put one person in charge, hold their feet to the fire for the next four to five years and transform the system and build a, a continuum of care that elevates um, everybody suffering from this uh, disease and the families that they impact and start to see that the true cost savings and, 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 and societal savings and improvements across the board. That's probably the quickest I've ever spoke. Um, uh, <laughs> and I will leave it to my colleagues to clean up whatever mess I've created here. But I'm, um, I, I would love to urge you all to recognize that there are three simple things that could be done in very short order, and um, we would have a dramatic impact on the state of Oregon. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. I don't think you talked too fast at all. <laughs> Uh, Chair Greenlick, members of the committee, my name is Mike Schmidt. I'm the executive director of the Criminal Justice Commission. Uh, happy to be here in front of you today to talk about a report that the commission was asked to do a couple years ago. Uh, and I would be remiss in not um, calling out Senator Jackie Winters, uh, who was really the driving force of, of uh, asking the commission to do this work. Uh, and many people contributed, as you can see on this slide, for us to, to make this happen. But essentially what the senator and then other supporters who, who signed on, uh, other legislators to ask us to do this work, what we were tasked with doing was really kind of, first and foremost, a descriptive analysis of, of where is the, what is the money we're spending and, and where is it uh, being spent. So we looked at how much are we spending and then who, how do those streams come together. Uh, and then we were asked with, okay, how much are we spending? What are the outcomes we are getting for that spend? So that was the, the goals of the report. Um, and I can tell you, and we'll go through the slides, uh, I think we were successful in uh, describing where the money is and who's spending what. Uh, the challenges we faced was really on the outcome side of things. So uh, scope of, uh, of the study, uh, we were, uh, because of federal regulations, uh, namely 42 CFR, uh, we were really stuck with looking at the public uh, side of outcomes, and the, the legislation tasked us with the public spend. Uh, so you can see 25% of our state is really falling into that public uh, part of, the, of who's covered by uh, resources, and the rest are covered by the private insurance. So this is, uh, we don't need to go into the, the, um, the finer points of this, but it just kind of reinforces some of the, the testimony you've already heard today from uh, Dr. Richardson and, and Mike Marshall uh, telling you where the deaths are coming from and where Oregon ranks across all those different car categories. Uh, we are uh, obviously ranking in some of the worst places across the country. And then to get to the, the fragmented system, uh, this slide really was our effort at trying to show how money uh, through our state flows into treatment services. So you can see across the top, we have state agencies and commissions and organizations uh, spread out all across, and we all have our different missions uh, and visions and goal statements. Um, so OHA, Department of Corrections, the Youth Authority, the Criminal Justice Commission, DHS, uh, and then the commissions that are also uh, have a part of this. Underneath that level, you have your CCOs, the 15 CCOs across the state. They obviously have a big uh, determining role in how money is allocated, followed by the counties, some of which, as you heard from Mike, uh, put in their own general fund to, to augment uh, services in their communities and the tribes. 
And then that kind of breaks down into our two systems, which are you know still pretty uh, bifurcated, our addiction system and our mental health uh, treatment system, even though we know a lot of times those things are, are extremely frequently co-occurring. Uh, and then finally down to the, the base level of, of the patients that we're seeing. So you can see it's kind of a complicated, complicated fragmented picture of how these streams flow down uh, to get money to people who need it. Uh, and this slide here uh, is just looking at the total um, expenditure. Uh, and so you can see really when you look at the 91% the at the top, most of our money is flowing through the, the health authority. That's where the, the vast majority of it is. Uh, but you can see Department of Corrections accounts for over 3%, 3.5%, the CJC almost 3% of our state's spending uh, on uh, addiction treatment. Uh, OIA, very small amount that they contribute, and the counties themselves put in another over 2% of funds uh, into our addiction treatment. So the vast majority of the money is coming from the Medicaid, non-Medicaid, uh, and then the public health spending directed by the, the health authority. Uh, and this slide here, uh, it looks at um, the per capita amount we've seen. So we looked at kind of a, a longitudinal analysis to see uh, are things, are the money we're investing per person, is that increasing over time? And it is, uh, and, and Mike pointed this out in his slides as well. We are spending more per person uh, on addiction treatment than we have year over year. The, it keeps going up, yet we're still in the same positions we are uh, in, this, in the country, in the nation of where we're ranking in all these categories. Uh, and then- I'm still replaying something from a few moments ago. The, the you said the federal regulations make it impossible for us to pinpoint the private expenditures on substance use <laughs> disorder treatment? Uh, Chair Greenlick, uh, what I was trying to say was that the federal regulations make it really hard for us to look at the outcomes of um, any kind of addiction uh, treatment spending. The 42 CFR prevents us from looking at um, you know, that kind of protected information to see what kind of outcomes we're having for those spend. Individual by individual, but aren't there ways to make the data uh, more available by making it not identifiable? Yes, uh, absolutely, Chair Greenlick. Um, there are definitely are ways if we had a system that worked to track those outcomes. Uh, and one of our recommendations in this report is that the system that we do have, the MOTS system, that could be used for those outcome treatment uh, measures uh, is not functioning. Uh, and that is something that needs to be addressed for us to, to measure those. Excuse me. I, I, I was just puzzling on that one for a bit. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so here we just look again at uh, the total enrollees uh, in our public health care. You can see it's obviously gone up since Medicaid expansion um, significantly, uh, but the same percentages of people with uh, substance use disorder, although they are more individuals, it's the same percentage of people in those enrollees uh, and are dealing with all kinds of uh, substance use disorders. This just looks at the average length of treatment. Some of the questions that we were getting uh, from the legislature were, uh, how long are people staying in outpatient treatment, in inpatient treatment? Is that changing over time? And there is some variation. We looked from 2015, 16, 17, 18, uh, but not significantly. That those, those numbers in terms of how much dosage people are getting uh, are, are relatively uh, constant over that short time period. Because we're the Criminal Justice Commission and we're looking at uh, the intersection of these issues and the criminal justice system, we looked at who in our criminal justice system are receiving treatment. Uh, and you can see that we have a large uh, percentage of the population are medium high risk offenders. Uh, and even in prison or in the community, we're serving around 20% of people are getting substance use disorder who are um, uh, assessed at needing those kinds of services. So maybe 20% in prison, 20% out of prison, and then one of our challenges in the criminal justice system is the coordination of both of those things, that people who are getting treatment in our systems need to have that continuation of care once they come back into the community, and that's an area that we need to, to continue to address. 
So uh, overall, our big uh, recommendations from, from our analysis, um, you didn't see much outcome data in this, a lot of description of, of who's spending what and, and what are the issues, but we don't know how effective we're being. Now, one of the only proxies that we've been able to even think about using for outcome data is essentially whether or not you show up to future appointments because we can see you in the Medicaid data if you show up again. But showing up to a future appointment could be evidence of success. It could be evidence that you're continuing to engage with the system and working on uh, the substance use disorders that you have. It also could be a, a measure of failure and not showing up can also could either be success or failure. So just counting how many times people show up back in our data is not a good proxy for, for tracking outcomes. So we need to uh, invest in a, in a system or fix MOTS or, or find a system that actually works to treat or to track outcomes uh, for the investments that we're making uh, in treatment. Um, collaborate with private and, and uh, insurers. Um, it's a big gap in our data. Uh, because we're really uh, limited to looking at the Medicaid spend. Uh, and so that's where most of our information comes from. But as we covered at the outset, 65% of our state are not cover for, covered in that system. So that's a big black hole in terms of tracking data. Um, I think continuing ongoing tracking of our expenditures to see as you all decide to allocate more investments in these issues, you want to know what you're getting back and how those things change. So this. When we did this analysis, it was, I think, previously done comprehensively about a decade earlier. Uh, it would probably be better to continue tracking this on an ongoing basis so you can see exactly where resources are being put. Uh, and then, you know, obviously we need to study the effectiveness of the investments that you all are allocating to this. Uh, I'll wrap by saying that we did put together on the CJC website a, a dashboard, an interactive dashboard that will allow you to click on the specific state agencies and see how their money gets spent in the community, what counties are, are putting in, uh, and then also show you some of the gap, uh, and there's a huge gap, and, and, and Mike uh, covered this as well, between people who are um, assessed at needing treatment and then who are actually receiving treatment. It's, it's a, I think, around you know, 70 or 80% of the people who are assessed at needing it, about 7 to 10% of them are actually receiving it. Uh, but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily uh, seeking it, but they're assessed at needing it and they're not receiving it. And so I think when you do that same analysis on the mental health side, you don't see the gap that large at all. Um, and so the addiction side has a lot of room to, to go to close that gap between people being assessed at needing treatment services and then uh, getting them into those services. So uh, check out the, the CJC website and, uh, and give us some feedback. Uh -oh. There we go. Right. It's you. Yeah. Thank you, Chair Greenlick and committee members. It's my privilege today to be at this table with um, our wonderful partners in the community. Um, as you can tell, you've received an immense amount of data today, um, starting with Steve um, and our SMI population and co-occurring issues, and then Dr. Richardson, and then, of course, thank you, Mike, for giving us those daunting statistics um, for our state. Uh, I am the executive director of the Oregon Council for Behavioral Health. That organization is a trade association for the people who are down on the ground doing the work. Um, we represent providers in the state of Oregon, and we actually serve every single population that was discussed today. Um, and so maybe part of the, my discussion, I'm gonna kind of switch it up a little bit, but I will go through the slides, is that we have uh, 40, over 40 member organizations that are private and nonprofit providers of behavioral health services. They all have a state letter of certificate, which means the Oregon Health Authority Licensure Division audits them every three years, and that they are certified and eligible to contract with the CCOs to provide services to Oregonians. The other piece is that all of our providers also take private insurance and various other contracts from state hospitals, all kinds of entities because they are private, private and private nonprofits, so they have braided funds at the direct service level that enable them to serve all the populations that have been discussed today. Um, the other pieces are membership of 40, 45 odd providers across the state range from five employees up to a thousand employees. So you, as you can see, the continuum of care from Ontario to Ashland is quite diverse. Um, many of those members 
provide both addictions and mental health services, but for today's purposes, I'm gonna really be focusing on the SUD services, because um, that really service area really does face some pretty unique uh, challenges. What I would say about those services is the services that are provided generally are, ev are evidence-based per contract, their quality, and just as in the CJC uh, recommendation did note, when there has been studies, people, the few people, as we've heard today, who can get into those services really do have um, a positive impact when they are able to engage and maintain and complete those services. I think the struggle that we face and that our providers have to make difficult choices around every day in local communities that you represent is how can they get access and who are they going to be able to serve with the limited resources that they have at hand? And we'll talk more about that in the slides, okay? Okay, great. So um, medical necessities. So for providers, there's some specific constraints around access, and really um, one of those is me medical necessity. So the treatment component that um, Mike really was talking about, dividing it up into prevention, treatment, and recovery, that is true. Treatment has a natural um, constraint around medical necessity that we don't always talk about, and that means that people who go to treatment actually have to be assessed to go to a level of treatment. So our uh, sector is really not meant to serve everyone. We are really a healthcare entity and we are meant to serve those people who meet the criteria for services. The other, oh, oh not quite. There's the other constraint, of course, is funding, which you all hear about very, very much. And um, we would say on the SUD side, this is one um, piece where it's different from some of the other services we provide. The SUD, substance use disorder funding, in the state of Oregon and nationwide is significantly under um, the same mental health services funding, um, and we're not even close to the physical health side of healthcare. What that really means is that the resources for agencies that are providing SUD services are very, very limited. Typically across our membership, um, no matter where they reside in the state, it's about 20 to 30% under daily operations. And I will tell you the operations of our members being private and nonprofit entities are very lean. They do not waste resources they can't afford to. Okay. Also on workforce, this is a daunting um, constraint on our system. As you heard today, there was a lot of discussion about needing to build the workforce, needing to train the workforce. And what I would say, as I mentioned, with many of our providers, because they do, they serve every single population that was discussed today. Um, they serve people coming from the criminal justice system. Mike and I talk about this a lot. Many of our providers have to really focus, and this is the hard choice piece that I was talking about, one of them, have to focus on having ready, available staff that have a strong generalist training. And if we think about veterans or SMI or forensic needs, those are actually additional layers of training on top of that general behavioral health training. So actually some of our most acute populations um, really would benefit from staff that has longevity in the field and also has multiple layers of training. Just like when you go to your primary care doc, they refer you out to the foot doctor or the eye doctor. If you're a veteran, you're really gonna benefit from somebody who has a strong training in veterans needs. If you have SMI, you're really going to benefit from someone who has a specialty in your particular area. If you have a co-occurring disease, that really means that that health care provider, that mental health care provider, really has to understand your mental health concern and your addiction concern and be able to work with your family. These are highly trained professionals, and it takes time to develop them and to retain them and to recruit them. So that's a constraint that really our folks as providers um, are facing, is recruiting and retaining these folks. So investment affects workforce, and so budgets for private and nonprofit healthcare providers are prospective and they fluctuate daily based on utilization and employee capacity. So when we're talking about scaling up access, this is one of the things that really the members of our organization face, and again, another place where they have to make hard decisions about who are they able to employ, who are those eight people able and qualified to serve, and how many people can they get in the door. When we're facing a 20 to 30% under 
funding of that position. That means they have to braid funds from counties, from private foundations, from grants, to ensure that they can even just fill that position. When we layer that with the workforce crisis that we're having, I think the last time I looked at a pretty typical uh, job posting for Oregon for behavioral health positions, there's several sites that specialize in those kinds of postings. On any given day, we have between three and 500 openings across the state. As you mentioned, my membership employs about 8,000 people. Those are huge amounts of unfilled vacancies, which directly impact um, the operations budget and the sustainability of agencies. Um, budgets are not static or guaranteed, so hard choices have to be made about what programs can remain open and what services can continue to have better access. Also, um, we really do compete with the larger market in our field. So the folks that we're ser talking about serving in our communities and really are priority populations, we're trying to keep that staff so that we can give them longevity and the workload, and also so they can get ongoing training and specialties. But what we find in our sector is as soon as folks get that license, that they are uh, a hot commodity. We have trained them very, very well, and they move on to hospital care, to administrative jobs, to government jobs, to many other positions, or open a private practice and, and do a solo practice. So what we find is that enhances the amount of churn that we have um, in our sector. So it's not about training necessarily. We're doing a great job of training. In fact, we're training people so well they're moving on. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of a conundrum. So how do we retain those folks? It's so important. Okay, next. So medical necessity affects the investment. So there's always a lot of discussion, I think, in our field about parity um, and particularly around addiction equity. And I'd like to kind of clarify that a little bit. Um, and also just to kind of divide how that really rolls out for providers. In the SUD continuum of care, we would really like to see funding equity, not so much parity. Parity really um, has to do more with how you apply billing, how the administrative burden impacts providers, and that there be consistency across those processes and operations and the administrative flow. And I think that that gets pretty complicated, but the components of that are really about the operation and mechanics of the behavioral health delivery system, not so much about how much money is going into it. The money question really is more accurately described as equity of payment. So equity of payment for mental health, equity of payment for SUD to the physical health piece. And that is obviously something where we still are lagging behind, not just Oregon, but nationwide. Um, the parity law really focuses on timeliness, authorizations of medically necessary services, and also disallowing some practices around quantitative limits and qualitative requirements. So this really rolls into the administrative burden component of the membership and the delivery system that we have here in Oregon. So as I mentioned, our members contract uh, with commercial insurance, CCOs, and all kinds of other things. Each of those payers does these processes slightly different. So you can imagine that that causes an immense amount of administrative cost for our member organizations. And when we have rates that are significantly under daily operations, that increases um, the amount of money that has to go into the operation versus the delivery, right? But we have to have the operations, otherwise we won't be able to operate. So these are some of the challenges that really our membership are focusing on. The good thing I would say is that they're pretty good at it. If they weren't good at it, they wouldn't be here. Um, and that they really do have the skills and the ability to do that. And that is why we're so excited to present um, with our partners today and to see the work that really started up last session around helping those larger bodies that are over us and support our system get things coordinated to increase the, the efficiency and to increase their coordination to help us do more with what we have. Um, because we can't do those things as providers. We really have to adjust ourselves to the larger environment. So those are pieces. Yep. Oh, they, oh, I didn't know you guys were gonna include that. So this slide really does describe that workflow crunch that I was talking about. And I think um, it really is a helpful way to kind of think about what providers are having to deal with um, and what our membership are looking at. So in that administrative burden and particularly on the workforce. So um, the first particular one is required education. So when we have detox, residential, outpatient uh, services, they're all different levels of very highly trained professionals, and then it just goes through the experience investment piece, and then it goes through the competition piece that I discussed earlier. So you have a nice little visual for that. 
and again, this is the piece. Um, we do, as a sector, do an excellent job of training our folks. We train them in the best practices, which is the quality component. We train them in the administrative processes, which is called the golden thread. And then we also help them get their licenses. With your support, we have done a fabulous job and probably need to build on the loan reimbursement to encourage people to enter the field. Um, and then also educational development and professional maturation. And we give that gift to other partners as they leave our system. So we had a few, three recommendations that I wanted to go over. And I don't have a slide for those. Oh. Yeah, unless there's any questions. I have a question after you. Oh, um, so I had a question about, thank you, Chair, um, about the reimbursement rates for private versus public, because in some of the conversations that I've been having in my community, that <coughs> tends to be a resonating thing, that uh, private health insurance does not reimburse at the same rate as, as Medicaid reimbursement, and even then both are, are kind of insufficient. Um, so in terms of like what is, what would be a good reimbursement rate for these services, do you have specifics about what that would be? Those are specifics that we can bring back to the committee and give you more detail on. I can speak in very broad terms. Um, Chair Greenlake, um, thank you for letting me answer the question to Rep Mitchell. Um, those really are, as I mentioned, on a broad scale, our SUD rates are 20 to 30 percent under um, the daily operations cost. And you are correct, in the experience of our providers, the reimbursement rate on the commercial side is significantly lower than the CCO side. Mm -hmm. um, that is why frequently folks, even on, our, even on our nonprofit boards, are like, well, you should do more commercial insurance. That really would actually make the issue worse. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is also why many of the members, the CCO, the amount of CCO um, recipients that they see is much higher than the commercial insurance side. Um, again, because that commercial sh insurance has much more administrative burden, so it has a lot more operations cost, along with that the payment tends to be lower, and also that the timeliness on those payments, which when we talk about sustainability for the organization and the ability to scale up for access, causes um, pretty significant troubles for the organization. So that is why we do see that, but I am happy um, to provide you with a little more in detail information, at least on our membership. Of course, not the entire provider network <coughs> across the state, but we can do that. It's something that I've heard as a complaint from a lot of people, so I imagine even as it mm -hmm. pertains to your members, that's probably a fairly consistent. Uh, it is consistent. I can, yeah, I can give you one brief example. Um, if we talk about residential care for youth mm -hmm. in Oregon, um, we have about we have five of the primary youth residential providers in our membership. They have approximately 78 beds for the entire state of Oregon for youth residential treatment. This is not a population health level intervention. Um, you know, we can't make a population health impact with that amount of service. And those beds are competitive between CCO and private insurance. Many folks who have commercial plans must go out of state to achieve services for their youth. This is not a best practice. It's not even a best practice in regards to what we do in the state because people have to move hours away from where their child um, will be placed for treatment. How do you do whole family treatment when it's a six hour drive or at an out of state flight? Um, and this is indicative of where our residential services for SUD um, lay. The um, parenting programs are in a similar situation with um, I think about 150 beds across the state of Oregon. And if I could just add two things. Number one, for outpatient treatment, which is oftentimes as effective, if not more effective than residential treatment, and certainly more cost effective and less disruptive to families and jobs and everything else, the reimbursement rates are that much worse relative mm -hmm. to the private sector, number one. And number two, I think um, it's been recommended to the Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission that they incorporate in their plan an ability to um, get private insurance to meet a threshold of re reimbursement rates uh, and address this issue, because to Mike's point, Point, it's 65% of the population of Oregon. And so yeah. if we truly want to create a, con a, a, a comprehensive system of care, we have to be looking at the private um, yeah. funders. And, and, you know, to Mike's point in that, that will help support the entire continuum of right. care because providers 
serve both systems. Right. So if we enhance both systems, we enhance the ability for providers to scale access and to better serve all Oregonians. So really the recommendations that we have through the Oregon Council for Behavioral Health is ensuring systems of reimbursement both on the public and private side um, to really increase the access and the ability to make a population shift in our outcomes for people who need medically necessary services, both on the CCO and commercial side as much as we can. And that really will support workforce, retention, operating a robust system with modern technology and data investments that we have not been able to have, and also ensure strong quality, quality fidelity care um, across the system because those fidelity models do take time and cost. And then also to take to continue the good work that we've started already on ensuring that Oregonians with both public and commercial coverage have a full and clear information on their behavioral health benefit, including where and how to obtain services, that they understand their full network, and that they are able to request services out of network when um, that is not locally available for them. We find that there's a lot of confusion for the people we serve around having access to that information from both their public and commercial plans. Um, I think we may, took some good steps last session um, and I think that we're building on that work would be fabulous. And then also to ensure that our public and commercial payers are supporting equitable access and assessing need in their service areas for public and within their plan membership for the commercial side, and that public plan payers have network adequacy practices in place that allow for continuous improvement to, ju to adjust to changes in our um, substance use disorder landscape across the state over time. As we know, um, we've had significant increases in meth use, and I think most of us here um, were in service during that time when we had our first meth episode, and it's quite frightening um, to see these statistics coming down the road, and providers are trying to become prepared for the specific services they need for this population. So thank you for your time. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, Chair Greenlee. Can, um, Oregon Recovers has an exhibit in the lobby um, that features uh, about 40 or 50 people, Oregonians who have died in the last two years. Uh, relative to their untreated addiction. And I invite each of you, some of them may be your constituents, but to stop by and um, also invite you, if there's someone you know you've lost to addiction, to fill out a little card and put it up on the wall because um, I realize and I know that this is a crisis that uh, impacts every one of us, including everyone in this room. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Chair Greenlick. And I, I just wanted to say one last thing, just to kind of correct the record. I know you do your homework, Mike, uh, because you, you have so much passion, and I know you do, but I wanted to correct the record on uh, Oregon beer taxes, um, because I this is actually a conversation I had with some colleagues last uh, legislative days around this idea of, like, deterrence and possibly even raising, you know, taxes on beer in the state of Oregon. Um, and someone said, we have the highest in the country, and that they didn't want that to happen, which was obviously not true. So I pulled up some statistics um, on what it is in every single state. Wyoming is two cents a gallon, and we are eight. Um, so they have a sales tax, oh, however. A sales tax. We don't okay. have a sales tax. Oh, so I the see. price, so and I would yeah. urge you to focus on this issue. Thank you. Um, but to uh, look at the cost, yeah. because cost is a prevention measure. Just like we're raising the price of tobacco, hopefully, with the ballot measure, another $2 a pack, I think. Um, the, the goal there is not just to generate more money, it's to reduce consumption. Yeah. The same thing here, when, when we have such a low threshold on the cost, the idea is to raise the cost. So particularly underage drinking, and as I said earlier, binge drinking, automatically goes down and that there's a huge uh, uh, economic and societal benefit from that and I completely agree I, I think I just wanted to point out that like even if we were to raise it to match like our surrounding states that would still give us a substantial ability to not only go towards that deterrence but to also invest in in uh, prevention programs and supports so thank, thank you. you thank you hey. I thought we were in along without you in this panel. <laughs> Go for it. So just a quick comment. Um, one of the things since I've come to the legislature that uh, I've often harped on, so I'll, I'll take the opportunity to do it again. We often hear <clears throat> more tax, more revenue, more tax, more revenue, more tax, more revenue. One of the things that I find disappointing in Oregon is on our tobacco master settlement agreement and our 
what we call stamp tax or pack of cigarettes that you mentioned that that uh, there's a ballot measure to raise significantly to uh, by two dollars a pack uh, from the one dollar and thirty two cents so basically three dollars and thirty cents but <clears throat> what I find disappointing is the Oregon legislature doesn't the Oregon Health Authority doesn't utilize anywhere close to the CDC recommendations for prevention. We spend about 1.5% right now out of the hundreds of millions of dollars that we bring in for tobacco tax. So you say it's not just for revenue, but I find that argument really hard uh, to accept because we don't spend on prevention. I don't know off the top of my head what the percentages are um, from you know spirits and beer tax, but you mentioned $11 million. It seems probably kind of in line with the 1.5%, uh, although I don't know those numbers off the top of my head. So I would like to see your organizations and more movement from the legislature to actually deal with the formulas that we have that don't address the problem rather than constantly coming back and say, we just got to raise it. You got to raise it so we get that 1.5% to a reasonable amount of money. Let's do the 30% that the CDC recommends first. Well, me, that's my comment. Thank you, Representative. Um, if I could, uh, uh, I appreciate what you're saying completely it's a very convoluted system that distributes the current revenue generated by the beer wine and alcohol tax right it and it mostly goes to cities and counties but in a really bifurcated way that's even hard to track i think we could mike's report was able to figure out how much but we don't we don't really know how it's going out the one thing i will say sir is we are in a crisis this is an emergency seven people are going to die today i appreciate that the process isn't right but to wait until we figure out the process before we deal with the emergency and start to save lives, I just think that's unacceptable. So I fully appreciate in the long term your, your concern about this, and it's why I would suggest that all of, if, if we increase the price of alcohol by 20%, let's put it under the direction of the Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission who has the comprehensive plan on what to do and let them invest it directly and also from year to year be able to make changes as we have success here or we continue to have failure here and to, to focus on it. But I'd urge you not to try and fix our legislative process before we actually deal with our addiction crisis because that means people are going to die. Of course, if we fix the legislative process, maybe we would have a reasonable amount of uh, no funding doubt, for but, it. But that's not what this committee is charged with. And, and, uh, and I come back to seven people are going to die today and seven people will die tomorrow. Let's talk right now. We should talk further about this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. There they are. Thank you. I'm good. You okay? I agree with no. you, by the way. I agree with you. Thank you. Let's do something about it. Let's throw that information there. I think it's handy. We have, um, we've invited anybody who has a behavioral health <coughs> LC for us to consider. And Two of us have offered them up. If there are any others, this would be a good time to introduce them to the committee. Let's start with Representative Salinas. And I'll see. I assume the LC has a number. It does have a number. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's LC 236, and um, it's really tackling a lot of what we talked about here today in terms of workforce. I think it will dovetail nicely, hopefully, with your um, behavioral health care blueprint plan. But um, as we know, I mean, as everybody here today said, we have a serious workforce shortage in terms of mental and behavioral health care providers at a time when our state is really experiencing a crisis and a need for services um, from um, care at all acuity levels. Um, Last session, Governor Brown convened a task force, and that task force is ongoing to address severe and persis persistent mental illness with a focus on teens and young adults. The Oregon Health Policy Board and various stakeholders have conducted their own studies and analyses um, and really trying to think about innovative policy solutions. As we've heard today, the Alcohol Drug Policy Commission has as well, and we should be seeing something from them. 
prior to the 21 session, but I think there are some things that we can put in place right now that can really help our workforce situation and then lead us into the 21 um, session. And this will be introduced as a committee bill in healthcare, but I would like this subcommittee to take a look at it first. Um, first, it will um, remove an exemption for individuals who lack the required education from the requirement to be licensed in order to pro practice professional counseling and marriage and family therapy. Right now, this exemption exposes unwitting consumers to potential harm from unlicensed counselors and it hamstrings the state's ability to hold these practitioners accountable for any harm they may have caused. And this, you will see this um, more frequently in terms of alternative um, psychological um, therapists. So, um, and the most one, the one I've heard most about is um, um, uh, hypnotherapy. Um, the second piece of it, it will change Oregon statutes to reflect person-first language, similar to a bill that Nevada passed in 2019. This really just gets at the idea around stigma um, and letting people really seek treatment. So they're not, you know, substance abusers, substance users, they're people with substance use um, disorders. Um, and then the third piece, which is the largest piece of this bill, it will direct a contractor or a consultant to prepare a blueprint for Oregon's behavioral health and mental health workforce that forecasts the current supply and future demand of behavioral health professionals in Oregon over the next five to 10 years, uh, regardless of payer, so public and private payer, across the continuum of care at all acuity levels. So it really will look at a comprehensive, like where are the pieces that are missing? Is rural Oregon the place where it's missing the most? Um, are peer support specialists the place that we should start? And really prioritize where that those workforce pieces need to come into play. And then I'm hoping to come back into 21 and really have some concrete policy and funding ideas moving forward in terms of workforce. Because as we've heard from um, our colleagues, Representative Hayden, we are spending quite, and we, we've heard from some of the witnesses today, we are spending quite a bit of money. How can we start to restructure this? And I hope I can have your support coming out of the Is healthcare committee. Um, Oliver, do we, yeah, and it still does need some refinement. I'm still working with OHA to um, refine what the consultant contractor piece looks like. I don't see it on here. You don't? Is it under health care, Oliver? Uh, Representative Salinas, it is. It should also have been posted for today's meeting as well for the, okay. for the subcommittee. We'll get that correct. Uh, C45 and 221, Green Lakes, Hope Amendment. Okay. No, not Hope. No, the, never mind. No, Hope that's, that's, that's the, you know that exactly. never mind. That's the 221 is the, kind of redefinition of oh yeah I see 221 as well I don't see 236 but we'll get it up and I'll share it and as I said it still needs some refinement I'm still working with OHA on what the uh, contractor piece looks like uh, I'd like to briefly comment and do it again this afternoon on LC 45 which is the behavioral health, health roadmap it came about after some discussions we had in an earlier session well, we looked at some one-off kind of proposals. This would be a great idea. This would be a great idea. Yeah, the, turns out they're all great ideas, but it's not clear how, how we can integrate them and have a systematic way to look at them. I suggest that there, the legislature, legislative branch needs to take some action. The executive branch needs to take some action. The judiciary branch needs to take some action to deal with with this question. The, the underlying idea is that if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. And what you need to do is start dealing with what we're trying to deal with in behavioral health, is to get some idea of what an ideal system would look like and what LC 45 does is it creates a commission that will be responsible for the legislative branch's activity in this area over the next decade. And it will have the commission staffed by the Legislative Policy and Research Office define what an ideal health ID behavioral system would look like, assess where we are now relative to that, deal with how we're spending funds across the range of behavioral health activities we're doing, 
and give each legislative session, starting with the 2021 session, a, a uh, charge of producing the policy and the uh, fiscal requirements that are needed to not only do good stuff, but to move us in a coherent, systematic direction over, over the next 10 years. And it produces, it suggests a structure for doing this that will link, one hopes, with the executive branch's work, and now it turns out the judicial branches has recognized that they have some responsibility in the behavioral health side. In fact, more and more responsibility with the drug courts and the mental health courts. So I appreciate it if you were all before we come back in February take a look at that. And I'd be delighted to have any of you like to co sponsor with me. And that's, I argue, and I think we heard some evidence of it today. It's, we really need to have a moonshot approach to this. This is what we really need to go after because we just can't waste another decade playing around on an ad hoc basis without any coherent and systematic movement in a certain direction. So that's one of my two moonshots for today. So, question? Yeah. So I see that the uh, makeup of that joint committee in the Legislative Assembly is the chairpersons of the committees and subcommittees related to behavioral health. So are you coming back for the 10 years? <laughs> <laughs> I'm handing off this baby that I'm leaving on the doorsteps of this police station <laughs> to raise. I am not coming back for 10 years. Okay. Well, maybe a year. Does <laughs> uh, anybody else have any? Uh, I, I don't have anything specific in this area. I do have something in the uh, health committee, which they will be presenting. And <coughs> as you know, we only have two babies to sit on the doorstep. So uh, one will be in, in that, one will be a non health related issue. But, uh, and 45 is a personal bill. But it is integration of oral and mental health, so it kind of touches on this, but I was planning on doing it in the main committee. Okay, well, we'll hear about this afternoon. Any, so. other, com any other comments? Anything else for the good of the order? No, we are adjourned. Before.